I'm in uh, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Um, I've entitled this morning's sermon, Lessons in 1 Kings 2. Please stand if you're able for the reading of the word. I'm in the New American Standard Bible, 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. And the scripture reads, As David's time to die drew near, he charged Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your sons are careful of their way to walk before me in truth, with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lock a man on the throne of Israel. Please be seated. Look at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, as David's time drew near, he gave Solomon a charge. He gave a charge to his son. But I think the first thing that we got to think about is David is acutely aware of his own mortality. His time to die is drawing near and he knows it. They say as your time draws near to pass from this earth and to be released from your own flesh, that your heart turns to your children and those you love the most. I have to agree with that. Your heart turns. But I would ask you today, why wait until you're at that point? <laughs> why wait? God didn't wait, did he? He didn't. His heart turned to his children a long, 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 long time ago. Jesus does the same thing. What do you mean? He, he's almost at the point where he knows he's going to the cross. And he takes, he takes the time to express to them the most important things that his father has delivered to him to give to them. And if you don't believe that, take the time this week and go through John chapter 13 through 17. Because Jesus is headed to the cross. And that entire dissertation that he gives to his disciples is before he goes to the cross. Even the what? The washing of their feet. The Last Supper. Who's this? Well, let's look at that. John, John 13. John 13, 33 through 35. Listen to this. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, now I say to you, also, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Who's escaped? It's the great equalizer, isn't it? What? The departing of the flesh. Believe me. Who's escaped? Who? Anyone? Even Jesus had to go through that, didn't he? Everyone has to go there. No one escapes. No one. Why? Because it's the very command of God. That's why. It stands to this day. It was a product of the fall. And at the fall, then the Lord turns to Adam. What does he say to him? Well, you see it right there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Listen to this. Genesis 2, 7. This is God speaking to Adam after the fall. And he says, then the Lord God formed man of the dust. Right? Let's go back. I'm sorry. God created man. Right? Where did he create him from? Then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils and the breath of life. And the man became a living being. So you know that man was created from what? Dust. And I had a really good friend, and I used, to, I used to refer to Julia as my rib. That's what I used to call her. So I, always, I would call her my rib. And she had a friend. She goes, well, that makes you dirt. <laughs> and she was right, because we're all formed from what? Woman was formed from a rib of the man, but I was formed from dirt. So she called me dirt. Anyway. But then after the fall, what happened? Well, here it is, Genesis 3, 17 through 19. Then to Adam, he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Curses the ground because of you. In toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. 
both thorns and thistles, it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread, till you return to the ground, because it is from it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. No one escapes. No one escapes. Everyone turns back to dust. We have people out there, they're like, they're really concerned, you know, because we have this tradition of what? Burying people. We have a tradition of doing that. We put them in a coffin, we bury them, we put them in the ground. And a lot of people don't want to go through this other thing that people have been doing a lot lately, which is called what? Cremation. You know, they burn, you know, it literally turns you back to literally what? Dust. And, and, I, and they're, they're afraid that somehow they're violating some principle of God. But if that's true, what do you do with all the other Christians in the world that have been burned at the stake? What, somehow God can't bring them back together? Yes, he can. What's your point, Chuck? I'm just saying, I, your traditions, you follow through with your traditions, but I'm just letting you know that if you ever decided you want to go through that, however you want them to deal with your body afterwards, that's, that's between you and God. And either way, you're okay, all right? Either way you go. No one escapes. Not the king, the highest king, the greatest leaders of the earth. Guess what? They've all returned back to dust. You see it in David as he gives his Solomon a charge. What? That his heart turns to his children. And in this case, his heart turns to Solomon. Surely the Lord loves you, child of the living God. He loves you. But you will notice the difference between he and us. He sees the beginning to the end. He does not speak to you out of impending death. No. He does not speak to you out of death. What does he speak to you out of then? He speaks to you out of eternal life. As you long for eternity and all that it is, so does he. And he wants that for you. Did you pick up? As you long for eternity and all that is, so does he. And that's what he wants for you. What? He wants you to long for eternity. He wants you to long for everything that is of eternity. And his heart has turned to you. David gives a charge to Solomon. What charge? What commission or command has the Lord given to you? Because that's exactly what David did. He turned to Solomon and he gives him a charge. And he begins to lay out this thing of what he wants Solomon to do after he's gone. He encourages him in many ways. But I would refrain from that and ask you this, then what charge has God given to you? What, is, what command has he given to you? What commission has he given to you as a Christian? I know the first one because we just read it. Just a moment ago, he commands you to love one another. That's a commission. He commands you to minister the gospel. That's a commission. That's the commands he's given to you. He commands you to seek out for the kingdom of heaven and all that is of it and to live it out. That's what he's commissioned you to do. That's, those are the things that God will have you to be and what he would want you to do. So you would ask this question, what charge did David give to Solomon? Well, he told him to be strong and to show yourself to be a man. What is it? That is to be strong and to grow strong. As a product of becoming strong, to be and to become, to exist and to come into being. To be what? To be a man. Does this only apply to men? No, it doesn't. What? 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 Does what only apply to men? To be strong. To be committed. To become. To be what God would want you to be. Does this only apply to men? The answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't just apply to men. Remember who it was who went in and stood up for the sake of her life and that of Solomon? You remember who that was just, just last week? You remember who did that? Who went into the king and told him? It was Bathsheba, his mother, at the encouragement of the prophet. <laughs> the prophet told her to go in and do it. And did she say, no, I'm not? No, she went in. She went in before the king and told him. Told him the truth. It was his mother. Be brave. Her strength 
enabled her to stand up, to intercede for her son, and to secure the throne for Solomon. Does your life matter? Does your life matter? Does it? Do you realize the effect that you can have upon the life of others? You do not live to yourself. Your life isn't about you. Jesus didn't come down to serve himself. We learned about that this morning in Bible study. He didn't come down. He came down and became a servant. Who did he serve? God his Father? Uh Uh-huh. But raise your hand because he served you as well in every aspect. He's given you everything that you need. He provided everything that you needed. And it's an amazing thing that you have the ability to intercede for those who are in your life. You could do that by prayer, right? Don't be afraid to go into the king. (laughs) Don't be afraid to tell him the truth about what's really going on. Even if it has to deal with, look, your own flesh and blood. Because that's what happened last week, right? Bathsheba went in to tell him, hey, your son, Adonijah, has seized the throne. Oh, that wasn't what God wanted. That's not what David wanted. And and she interceded. And what happened? What was the end result? Well, David stood up, even to his own son, and put the real king on the throne. That's what happened. You have the ability. You have the power. You You have the ability as a Christian to live your life for God. You know that, right? You can live for God. Yes, you can. And when, you're hearing, when you hear those other thoughts that says, no, you can't, that's not God telling you that. Amen. That's not God telling you that. You're, you're, I can't do it. Yes, you can. It's called a will. And we were talking about this this morning. So now I'm completely off topic, but it's okay. But we were talking about this this morning. What? That you, you fill yourself with the word of God in your mind, and in your heart, and your soul. Right? And you know, you know the word of God. You know exactly what his word says. And then all of a sudden, you, you're, you're in a moment in your life because you don't have your Bible right there constantly, right? You live life, right? You're out in the field. You're doing your work. You're doing your job. You're vicariously living your life. And all of a sudden, the situation comes up. And before Christ, before you knew the Lord, and you walked past somebody, you didn't even take thought to anybody that you walked past. You didn't even take a thought to them. No matter what their situation was, no matter how bad it was, you just walked past And then you got born again. You got born again. All of a sudden, God starts changing your heart. All these wonderful things start coming into you. Like what? Like love and care and concern and mercy. And all of a sudden, your eyes are open to what? Ministry. (laughs) The ability to actually affect a life. And you do it. All of a sudden, you walk past the same situation, and you see that situation. What do you do? Your heart has compassion. You have the ability. And then you do something. What's changed? Well, you have. You have. You've changed. All of a sudden now you've got the will of God because it's God who's working in you to will and to act and to do good things according to his own good pleasure. And that's what he wants for you as a Christian. That's what he wants for you. He cares about you. So be brave. Intercede. Have mercy. Do the things that God would have you to do, no matter what comes in your life right now. There's something about standing strong in the Lord, to stand for him in the gospel. It is the essence of true character built upon the love of God and a love for God. How do you know that? Because you can stand strong. You can. Otherwise, the scripture wouldn't tell us so. Look at Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord. There it is. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. I want to stop here for a moment because whose strength is it? It's the Lord's. And I want you to remember this towards the end of the sermon today. Remember this. Who is it? I'm walking in the strength of God. I'm walking in his strength. I'm walking strong in him and the things of him. That makes me strong because I'm strong only in in him. He is my strength. Verse 11. Be strong then. And then verse 11 says, put on the full armor of who? It's not the armor of man. It's the armor of God. So that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces 
of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything to stand firm, well then stand firm. Having guarded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having your shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, which is with you, with, with you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take on the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert, all perseverance of petition for all of the saints. And pray on the behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in change that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Take on the armor of God. Put on the armor of God. Train yourself in the armor of God. Put those things on and then stand. And when you can't stand, then stand. And when you can't, when you can't do it anymore, then stand anyway. Have courage, have character. That's what Solomon is telling his, his son, to be strong. As you stand for the Lord, who do you demonstrate that to? Who are you demonstrating that to? I mean, what are you standing against? You're standing up, but for what purpose? Surely, surely the world and the people around you, you become what Jesus wants you to be. That's what you do. You become exactly what Jesus wants you to be. You stand up. What are you talking about, Chuck? You become what Jesus... Yeah, listen, look. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. You are the salt of the earth. That's what you become. Now you give flavor to the world. <laughs> you preserve it. <laughs> right? Salt, salt, it gives flavor to food, but it is also used for what? Preservation. You, Chuck... I have the ability to bring preservation to the world. Listen, listen, if you are a Christian and you have the ability to impact the world around you, absolutely. When you deliver the gospel message and you lead people to Christ, what does that do to them? Well, it preserves them. <laughs> For how long? Forever. Forever. Yeah. You give, you give flavor to the world? Do you agree with that? You become salt? That's what salt does. I get accused of using too much salt. You never know. You know I, I do. I get accused of using too much. But I like flavor in my food. I love it. I like that bite of salt. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? The answer is, it can't. It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. So why would you want to hide your Christianity then? Well, the answer is, you shouldn't. The Lord has called you salt. The Lord has called you light. And that's exactly what he wants you to be. Verse 15. Nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So what, it's, what is it really all about? As you being a born-again Christian, what is it really all about? There it is right there. To shine before men and to give glory to God. For you to give glory to God? Uh-huh. But also for them to give glory to God through the light that you shine and the salt that you are. What should you do then? What, what should I do, Chuck? What, 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 tell me something. What should I do? Well, I, I would say this. Listen to the Lord and what he's put in your heart to do, and then go and do it. Walk in God's ways. Live it out. Live his love out. Preach the gospel. Minister at every opportunity put in your path. Walk in the ways of Jesus Christ. Walk with and in the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Word of God and live it out. Why? Because God is with you. God is with you. He wants you to be just that. 
Help me to understand, Chuck, what am I really supposed to do? I, asked, I, I, I was talking to a friend this morning, and I think sometimes you just find yourself in ministry and you don't even know it. I had no intention of becoming a minister and a preacher and a teacher of God's word. I've got to tell you that. That was, not my, that was not my plan. In fact, if you had told me that when I was at, at, at 17 or 18 years old, I would have told you you were absolutely crazy. You had lost your mind. Because I was not headed in God's path or his direction by any shape, means, or form. And I, I shared this on, on uh, Thursday night, and I'll share it again. Because I'll never forget. I'll never forget the moment that I got born again. I'll never forget it. And I needed Christ in my life. And I had been told I was a Christian all my life, and I wasn't. I wasn't. I know that God's hand was over me and protected me. I think that was because I had all these really good other Christian people in my family who were praying over me all the time. And God heard those prayers. And I believe that with all my heart because I needed it. I'm the reason my mother had gray hair. This is no joke. I'm the, I'm the reason. I, I really believe that. I, I put so much stress on my mom. I, I just I can't even believe it. But I got to a point where I joined the United States Air Force and I met a guy named Joe Cole. And he kept asking me to go to church with him. He kept asking me and kept asking me. I said, I'll go one time. I'll go. He goes, but are you going to go? And I'd go, no, not today. Well, one time he asked me, he said, you're going to go to church with me? And I said, yeah, I'll go. He goes, you mean it? I'm like, yeah, I mean it. I'll, I'll, I'll be there tonight. So he came over. He picked me up. He was all excited. On the way there, he's trying to explain to me all that's, all that's going to happen, what we're going to do there. And i got to tell you, I'm coming through from an extreme Catholic background. Because that's who I grew up as a, as a Catholic. And when you went to church, you didn't say a word. You didn't do anything. You sat there, you were quiet as best you could until everything was done, and then you left. That was my, that was my experience as a Catholic. And right before we went into this church, um, I was walking up to the step, and I'll never forget this. I literally heard a voice say this, don't do it, don't go in. And it sounded just like that too. And I was like, and I stopped and I went to step back and, and Joe literally had to turn around and grab me by the hand, grab me by the hand. And he looked me right in the aisle, I'll never forget it. And he said, just try it once. If you don't like it, you don't ever have to come back. And so I was like, I needed that encouragement right there at that moment because I would have turned around and never went in that church. And, and, and so I was like, okay. So I went into this church, and I got to tell you, we walked in. This church was jumping and hopping. I'd never, I'd never seen people so excited about God before in my whole life, right? And I mean, this, this church was packed out. And I thought, okay, we'll sit on the edge. That way, when everything's done, I can bolt out and be gone in a moment. You know, that was the plan. No. Uh, what does Cole do? He marches me right to the middle of the whole church, right? This is no joke. Two chairs are open, all, the only place in the middle of the church. And he sits me down. And so I'm sitting there watching all these people praise God, enjoying all this. And I'm like, oh, man, what have I, what have I got myself into? And Joe was sitting next to me. And he turned to me and he goes, okay, Chuck, I'm, I'm going to worship God now. I'm like, okay, Joe, you go ahead. So he did. He started praising and worshiping God. And after a while, I stood up and started participating because I felt funny. And uh, we left. I had all kinds of people coming up to me, just really kind people that I'd never met before. And I could just, I saw a difference. And we left. And I went back. And I went back again. I went back again. I went back again. And all of a sudden, the, the Lord really started ministering to me. And then all of a sudden, one night, a guy named Robert Slaritan came in and was preaching. Robert Slaritan, I'll never forget this. And me and Joe were in church that night. And uh, he was preaching. And Roberts was talking about how God had called him out of his body, took him up into heaven, and gave him a grand tour of heaven. And I'm like, this guy has lost his mind. This, uh, this is no joke. This is actually what I'm thinking. This guy, this guy's lost his mind. But I was enjoying the story because he talked about things. He, he said things like this. He, he talked about how, how he would walk across the grass. He goes, he's walking across the grass in heaven, and he turned around and looked, and boop, 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 all, all the grass popped back into perfection. I was like, oh, come on, man. You know, and then he talked about how the Lord was giving him this other tour, showing him all these other things. He said, then at, at one point, they get into a boat, and they're going across the crystal sea. And he said, literally, the fish were sticking their heads up out of the water and talking to him. Hello, Roberts. I'm like, this guy is really, he has lost his mind. 
And then, all of a sudden, he says they get all the way up to the shore. They get up to the shoreline. They get out of the boat. And they step up on the shoreline. And the Lord goes down into the water. And he said, the Lord said, Robert, you need to come down into the water. So Roberts went over. He looked into the water. He said he could not see bottom. And he said, but he went over because the Lord told him to. He stuck his foot in. He thought there was something he could stand on. And when he went to take a step in, he stumbled and fell and splashed water all over Jesus. And I want you to imagine, he said, at that point, he said, then him and the Lord got into a water fight in heaven. You imagine this? Him and the Lord getting into a water fight in heaven. And this is what killed me. This is what brought me to the Lord. All that, yeah, but this is what brought me to the Lord. It was like God took an arrow and put it right through my heart. Because Robert said this, he goes, not only did I realize at that moment that Christ had went to the cross for me and died for me, but that he was my very best friend. He was my best friend. And that, oh, I, I, there was nothing I, it was, I was at a loss. I was at absolute loss. And I was like, I've wanted that my whole life. I, this is what I want. This is what I need. It was like the Lord met me in that moment. And he gave an altar call. And he said, if you want to know Christ this way, come. And I saw people get up out of their chairs, and they struggled. Uh-uh, I ran. I ran. And I fell down before the Lord. And I asked him into my life. And you know what? I told Wayne, I told these guys this, the, last, the other night, I told them it's the cleanest I've ever felt in my life. That moment when I accepted Christ and I confessed all my sins, I felt the cleanest I had ever felt in my life. And after that, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit. I'm not ashamed of that either. I needed the I, I, it, Look, at that point, it was like, if it's of God, I want it. And they took me into a room. And they were praying for me. Nobody taught me. They didn't seek me in it. They didn't say, hey, you know, this is what you can expect. That nobody conditioned me to believe in the Holy Spirit or what I was about to receive. I didn't have any training on that. I hardly even knew anything in the Bible. All I knew was that I was born again. That's all I know. I was right with God. And I told the Lord, I was like, Lord, if it's from you, I want it. And so they prayed for me. This guy, there must have been 15, 20 of us in this room in a semicircle. And this guy... He came up, and all he did was he prayed for me, laid his hand on me, and he walked past me. And I'll tell you what, when the Holy Spirit hit me, everyone in that room knew. Because you know I can preach, right? I didn't, know I, I, I didn't know I could project until that day. That's no joke. And uh, the Holy Spirit fell on me and gave me a brand new language, filled me with the Holy Spirit in a moment. And I'm not talking about a few little words. I'm talking about an absolute language in a heartbeat. And I'll tell you what, I was praising God with all that I was. Everything was just honoring and exalting God inside. I knew that, but it was in a language that I had just learned spiritually. And I got to tell you, the guy who prayed for me, he was in absolute disbelief. Because I'll tell you this, you know, I, I know in some of those situations they have plants, what they call plants, to make everybody think, but I wasn't his plant. And, and, and he turned around and looked at me, and I got to tell you, I saw the disbelief in his eyes. And then when he realized it was real, he was like, oh, God's going to do something tonight. <laughs> What's the point, Chuck? The point is the cleansing. The point is the healing. The point is the born again. Getting right with the Lord and being right. You know, that's what the Lord would want for you today. Be right with him. What should I do then? I'll say it again. Listen to the Lord and what he would put in your heart. And then do it. Walk in God's ways. Come to know him. Live out his love. Preach the gospel. Minister at every opportunity put in your path. Walk in the ways of Jesus Christ. Walk with and in the Holy Spirit. Walk in the word of God. Live it out because God's with you. Look at verse 3 and 4. Verse 3 and 4 in 1 Kings chapter 2. David, again, speaking to Solomon, he says, Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to what is written in the law of Moses, that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn, so that the Lord may carry out his promise which he spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons are careful of their way, 
to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Verse 3 and 4 makes it clear. What? What can I learn? Here's a lesson. Keep the Lord's charge to you. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes. Keep his commandments. Walk in his ordinances and his testimonies. The Psalms are replete with these terms. What? Statutes, commandments, ordinances, testimonies, the word. It's replete. As you know, the Lord has put that on my heart a lot lately, right? You go back five, six weeks ago. And that's all I've been talking about is Psalm what? 119. Listen to these verses. Psalm 119, verse 93 through 112. Listen to them. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have revived me. Do you want revival? You'll find it in God's precepts. I am yours. Save me, for I have sought your precepts. The wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. I've seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Oh, how I love your law. It is the meditation. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever mine. I have more insight than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, because I have, have observed your precepts. I have restrained my feet from every evil way that I may keep your word. I have not turned aside from your ordinances, for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. From your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn and will confirm it that I will keep your righteous ordinances. I am exceedingly afflicted. Revive me, O Lord, according to your word. O accept the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. My life is continually in my hand, yet I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, yet I have not gone astray from your precepts. I have inherited your testimonies forever, for they are the joy of my heart. Listen to the last verse. I have inclined my heart to perform your statutes forever, even to the end. Even to the end. Obey him. Obey the Lord. Not because you have to, but because you love him and you want to. Keep his commandments and make them your own. Keep his ordinances within the word of God and you will find revival. You will find comfort in all that you ever need. You know what? If you study it hard enough, you'll even find Christ himself. I believe that with all my heart. Why? Why, Chuck? Why, why should I do so? Well, verse 3 tells you why. You will succeed in all that you do and all that you put your heart and hands to, and all that you put your soul and strength to, it will succeed, because it will be a byproduct of your genuine love of and for God. You love Him, don't you? You love Him. Well, if you really love Him, you will succeed. Well, it doesn't look like Jesus succeeded. He went to the cross. Yes, He did. Oh, He succeeded. You know how I know that? Anybody in this world who considers themselves a Christian and has been born again, is his success. Amen. You're his success. You are a byproduct of his life and the life that he gives. Amen? You love him, don't you? You love him. Be careful of your way. Walk before God in truth. Jesus did and he still does. Jesus is the truth. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. The word of God is truth. He has put these upon your heart and in you. He's literally written them upon the tablets of your heart. He has caused his truth to live and reside in you. And through truth, he has made you alive again. Therefore, stand up and walk. Stand up and walk before him in holiness. What shall your response be to this deliverance? And your salvation, what would your response be? The Lord has rescued you from death itself. He has granted to you life, even as he has life. 
He has poured into you his love, his hope, his faith, his peace, his mercy, his grace, and he's given to you of his only son. If David, if David would say such things to the son of his inheritance, what words would the God of heaven speak to you, O child of God? What would he speak to you? If that's what David would say to his son, what would the Lord say to you right now? O child of the king, the very word of God speaks by Jesus. So what would he say to you? I would say this. So show yourself to be a child of the king. Show yourself to be a child of the king. Be strong and walk before him and the word in his truth. And walk before the world in such a way, in love and his truth. Live life as I do. That's what Jesus would say to you. Live life as I do. Live forever. That's what he would say to you. I was thinking about this. You know, your enemy, what do you, what, what do you generally do to your enemy? With your enemy and those things that are against you, what do you, what do, you do to them? Generally, people run. I want to have this conversation with you. Generally, when your enemies come in, what do you do? You run. When the thing's coming at you, you run and you flee. You flee from those things that stand against you. You flee from them. I want to change your heart today. I would, I would say God would want to change your heart today because David didn't do that. David didn't do that. You listen to this clearly. Listen to this scripture. Listen hard to what David is saying. And I would remind you what I reminded you earlier. Who is your strength? Who makes you strong? Who? God. I don't know what your enemy is today, but I want you to stand today. That's what the Lord would say to you. Stand up to it. Stand against it. Destroy it. Remove it from your life. Why do you say that? Listen to 2 Samuel chapter 22. Now my friend told me to read it slow, so I'm going to try to do that. I'm going to try. And David spoke the words of this song to the Lord in the day that the Lord delivered him. You get this? He's talking about his deliverance. From the hand of all his enemies... And from the hand of Saul, this is what David said. He said, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my rock in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold and my refuge. My savior, you save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. And I am saved from my enemies. For the waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction overwhelmed me. The cords of Sheol, which is death itself, surround me. The snares of death confronted me. In my distress, he was smart. What did he do? In my distress, I called upon the Lord. Yes, I cried to my God. And from his temple, he heard my voice. And my cry for help came into his ears. Then the earth shook and quaked. The foundations of heaven were trembling and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went out of his nostrils. Fire from his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down with thick darkness under his feet. And he rode on a cherub and flew. And he appeared on the wings of the wind. And he made darkness canopies around him. A mass of waters, thick clouds of the sky. From the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. You get this picture? David, David, he cries out to God, and guess who shows up? God shows up. Verse 14, the Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. Then the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were laid bare by the rebuke of the Lord. At the blast of, his, of the breath of his nostrils, he sent from on high. He took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too strong for me. You hear in the picture? You get the picture of David? You, you, people don't look at David as this cowering person But David is saying his enemies were too strong for him. And so he had no choice but to what? Cry out to God. Cry out to God. You got enemies in your life right now taking advantage of you, 
You, are your enemies against you, standing against you? Will they cry out to God and watch him show up? Verse 19. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He also brought me forth into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanness of my hands, he has recompensed me. For I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not acted wickedly against my God. For all his ordinances were before me. And as for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also blameless toward him, and I kept myself from my iniquity. Therefore the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness before his eyes. With the kind, listen, with the kind, you show yourself kind. With the blameless, you show yourself blameless. With the pure, you show yourself pure. And with the perverted, you show yourself astute. And you, and you save an afflicted people, but your eyes are on the haughty whom you abase. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord illumines my darkness. For by you I can run upon a troop. Listen, from the Lord, for by you I can run upon a troop. By my God I can leap over a wall. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tested. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is a rock besides our God? God is my strong fortress, and he sets the blameless in his way. He makes my feet like hinds feet, and he sets me on high places. He trains my hands for battle so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have also given me a shield of your salvation, and your help makes me great. You enlarge my steps under me, and my feet have not slipped. I pursued my enemies. Listen, verse 38. Remember what I was telling you? Why do you keep dealing with the enemy? Listen to what he does to his enemy. Verse 38. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them. I did not turn my back until they were consumed. And I have devoured them and shattered them so that they did not rise and they fell under my feet. For you have girded me with strength for battle. You have subdued me under those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me. I'm not running from them. They're running now from who? From me. And I destroyed those who hated me. They looked, but there was none to save. Even to the Lord, but he did not answer them. Then I pulverized them as the dust of the earth. I crushed and stamped them as the mire of the streets. You have also delivered me from the contentions of my people. You have kept me as head of the nations, a people whom I have not known even serve me. Foreigners pretend obedience to me. As soon as they hear, they obey me. Foreigners lose heart and come trembling out of their fortresses. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be God, the God of my salvation, the God who executes vengeance for me and brings down peoples under me, who also brings me out from my enemies. You even lift me above those who rise up against me. You rescue me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the nations, and I will sing praise to your name. He is a tower of deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and his descendants forever. Who are you going to trust in? Who are you going to put your hope in? Who are you going to run to? You run to him. Let him be your strength. Watch him set you in the place that he wants you to be. Watch him rise you up. Watch him give you a name for you as you honor him. Watch him. Watch him plant people in your path. Watch the enemy of your life and those things that are against you flee from you instead of you fleeing from it as if it's bound you. Watch it flee from you. Be strong. Take courage. Take hope. Take faith. Surround yourself in God. Let him be your shield. Let him be your stronghold. Run to him. Why? Why? Because it's a lesson in 1 Kings chapter 2. <laughs> it's a lesson. Run to him. What are you dealing with right now? i got this elbow. It won't obey. Run to him. 
What do you got going on in your life? It doesn't matter what it is. Run to him. Go to your refuge. Cry out to him. David did. He was smart. And the Lord showed up. And I'll bet you his enemies were terrified. They were absolutely terrified when David came in around. You know why? Because they knew that they weren't fighting against two. They were not fighting David. They were fighting against God. And that, my friend, is always a losing battle. You're struggling against God. You've got to struggle with God. It's not wise to struggle against God. That's not smart. You know what's smart? What's smart is to come before him. Bow before him. Give your life over to him. And get on his side. Get on his team. Because once he becomes your teammate, and you his, who can stand against you? I can leap a wall. I can take on anything. And God, because he's my strength. David stood against a giant whom everyone else, the entire army of Israel, trembled against this giant. And David went out to meet him. Not in his own strength, not in his own power but in the representation of who? God. And God gave him great victory with a single, listen, with a single stone. A single stone. He took down a giant. Who? David? Uh Uh-uh. God. God. Be encouraged today. Be strong. Stand. Stand firm there. Any thoughts? Any scriptures? Wait. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will let you die. There's that sense of humbleness before God. It's an amazing thing to have the strength of the Lord, but in the humbleness. Amen? You know, Jesus had at his command an entire legion of angels if he wanted them. All he had to do was ask, but did he do it? Why? Because he knew why he was here. He knew what he was designed to be and what he was to do, and that was for you and for me. He humbled himself in order to be our servant. So even in great strength, what? Still be merciful. Still be full of the love of God. Make sense? Any thoughts? Any scriptures? Go ahead. I got a message from uh, my grandson, grandson, a cousin, Kyle. And we have prayed for his uncle Chad before with cancer, esophageal cancer. But his cancer has spread. And... He's gone through all the treatments and all the different things, but he, the uncle himself, lifted his wife up, wants to lift his wife up in prayer for her to have the life that she should have had with him for a long time. <laughs> anyway, that's just prayer for Chad and Catrice. We go to Let's pray for him then, Mom. Lord God, we lift them up to you, Father. Chad and Therese, we, we lift them up to you, Father. We ask that you minister to them. You hear the heart of a man who wants for his wife what she's always wanted. And we lift that up to you, Father God. We pray for him, specifically healing, we would pray. Strength to them. We would ask that you would enter in, Lord. In, in the trial that they're enduring, Father, let them run to you and find refuge in you. Help them to find the strength that they need to struggle through and be there with them, Father God. We would worship you in that and trust you for it. Father, we we lift them up to you and ask that you would surround them with their family, with yourself, with your spirit, and all those who are of you, Father. And again, minister to this family, we would pray. Strength to those who are dealing with the loss, the potential loss. Grant them hope and faith. And trust in you, Father. Lord, we're grateful to you today for your word. Cause it to live inside of us. Help us to take it to heart. More so, help us to live it out. Even as you live, help us to live, Father. We worship you today, Father. Just thank you for your word. Just impart it more to us, Lord. Help us to trust you. To run to you. For you alone are God and there is no other. You are my strength. You are my tower. You are my everything. And uh, we love you, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.
Oh. Uh-huh. 